Thank you to the entities of the Void Unknowable for sponsoring this episode of Paul M. Bradley's Psychic Cafe. And now, on to the show. Hello once more to another episode of Paul M. Bradley's Psychic Cafe. Today we are joined by the wonderful Chris Luard, author of the Such Sweet Thunder Meditation book, host of the Such Sweet Thunder Meditation podcast, and owner of the suchsweetthunder.org website. He's a wonderful teacher of Buddhism, and I'm delighted to have him with us today. Uh, we'll be discussing key aspects of Buddhist teachings, such as the Brahma Viharas, and how they can relate to the troubles that we face in the modern world, and uh, particularly around the issue of the pandemic. Joy of joys! Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, seriously, it's it's wonderful to have him with us. Uh, I, I feel honoured to still be talking to the man who taught me meditation in the first place. Uh, and I hope that you'll enjoy it too. So without further ado, here he is, the one, the only, Chris Luard. It's time, 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 time. Hi, Paul. Hey, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? Fantastic. Well, I had a bit of a kerfuffle. I'm going to have to fix this when I've done the podcast. I went to do a sort of prayer thing and I went to clap like that. And when I did, I, I knocked the light bulb out of my ceiling. So <laughs> talk, talk about impermanence. I think I might need to get a new light bulb now. Uh the danger of prayer. <laughs> yeah, don't do it, kids. It's too dangerous. Don't risk it. Uh, well, fantastic. It's uh, it's wonderful to have you back uh, back on the show. Uh, thank you. I'm happy to be back. So thank you for thank you for the invite. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I suppose uh, it's uh, kind of uh, fitting. We were sort of discussing. Uh, how like where we're gonna how we're gonna have this conversation over the web and that because I suppose I, I suppose what I really wanted to talk about there was something I was actually going to talk about last time but I thought we'll need that to another time because um, uh, I really wanted you back basically uh, well we're in we're in uh, we're in interesting times uh, <laughs> needless to say um, we're in a sort of uh, global uh pandemic which you know it's it's hit my my country very bad and i know uh where you are currently uh it's it's not been great either so yeah. i suppose just how how has how 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 have you how have you been in fairness it is how have you been with no. the covid <laughs> situation yeah well thank you for asking paul and and um I, you know I, honestly personally i i'm doing very well um my you know, my meditation practice has been very, very strong. I've been meditating, um, you know, several hours a day, pretty much every day. Um, I really got into it. I, I did a, a solitary retreat in my apartment um, for a week in December over New Year's into January. And so for that, I was meditating eight to ten hours a day for, for that week. And I kind of just kept it going. <laughs> I mean, my partner, my partner came back into the apartment, but but um, other than that, I, I I just kept the the multiple hour routine going. Um, you know, alongside I was also teaching, and I facilitate online retreats too, so I couldn't quite do, you know, eight to ten hours a day every day. But 
for the most part, I, I've been meditating pretty consistently since then. Wow. Until then, I, I did another solitary retreat here in my apartment in September, and then it, it kind of became the bookends. I don't know why it happened, but but at the end of that retreat, I, it was like, okay, I'm going to take a break. <laughs> uh, well, I'm still meditating maybe two or three hours a day, but 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 um, it feels like I'm on vacation. Uh, yeah. It's too much of a piece. I'm too... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> too enlightened. <laughs> it's, you know... And when I look back over my my career of of meditating, it, it does kind of wax and wane that way. But but I think that was the longest stretch in my thirty six years of meditating, where I, where I was able to do, you know, six, seven, eight hours a day, sometimes ten hours a day for for almost a whole year. Um, and I owe that to COVID. That that's a direct, you know, I've you know, I haven't been traveling. I haven't been you know doing much of anything mm. <laughs> going to the grocery store that's it <laughs> yeah and, and uh, you know so for that it has been good um of course there are downsides you know I, my brother had covid last month and so and you know he doesn't he, he's okay he recovered fortunately but there was a there was a, a about a week or two that was quite scary um uh my niece and nephew have both had it uh, so, and, you know, I'm here in Thailand and Chiang Mai and, and, um, the vaccine rollout has been really kind of absurdly slow. Uh, so I've just been vaccinated. My partner is still on the list. Uh, we're hoping she'll be vaccinated by the end of the year. Um, and so for that, you know, it's, you know, there's, you know, it's been uncomfortable in that, in that sense. You know, also uncomfortable for me just to see the amount of suffering that's happening in the world. You know, I, you know, I've dedicated I've, the vow that I took was to alleviate suffering. And so when I turn on the news and when I, you know, talk to people who are really struggling in the world, um, I feel that, you know, and um, it seems like a golden opportunity for the world to come together in some sort of compassion uh whether that's happening or not i you know on tuesdays and thursdays i think it is you know? <laughs> but, you know what I mean? it depends on how you look at it you know yeah. the, the fact that you know uh, you know underprivileged countries are really struggling to get vaccinated and you know wealthy countries like america and many places in europe have have an abundance of vaccines that people are refusing to take so you know the 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 inequalities worldwide are really kind of glaring, mm. you know, and I, I feel you know I, I that it kind of is heartbreaking for me uh, to see that not only because I'm in one of those underprivileged countries, um, but just to know that you know places like Africa, three percent of the population is vaccinated, and and, and so it's, it's yeah it's and you know. I, Eventually, we have to come around to the idea that nobody is safe until everybody's safe, you know, Absolutely. and and that's, you know, that's it. And, and so whether it's, you know, what, it'd be great if we could come to that before some sort of mutation to this virus comes up that can defeat the vaccines. You know, that that's the real, you know, for me, the real worry um, to you know, touch wood that hasn't happened at this point. So. Yeah. 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 I, I, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I'm. This is, this is one of the times that I feel genuinely relieved to be living in the UK. Which, in fairness, with the situations at the moment, that's becoming increasingly <laughs> like rare for me to feel relieved at living in the UK. But we've had an incredibly mm -hmm. fast vaccine rollout and a, a fairly decent uptake on it. So um, it's a kind. That's a slight. That's a bit of a relief. Um, and yeah, I, I loved what you're saying about um, the sort of we've got to be coming together at the moment because it, it really i i, I have a, a similar sort of uh feeling uh except i'm not I, i'm not watching the news as much anymore just for the sake of my own sanity um sure. but it the the more i do it, it though i find that on the map on the 
the macro level, things still seem to be in, in utter turmoil and division. But I'm finding more and more on the, on the micro level, just people are having little internal realizations one by one mm. and people are starting to i think people are starting to realize these these things i mean uh you know a friend of a friend of mine um just very recently um like actually a couple friends in fact have actually said hey paul uh that meditation thing you're trying can, can you can you teach me <laughs> which i'm oh, good. you know i'm doing my i'm doing my yeah. level best but i'm no I'm no Chris. <laughs> and hey, we all do what we can do, you know, and, and that's, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what counts. And it, it's just, it's, yeah. it's nice. It's nice to see those kinds of, um, internal realization of people. It, it, it almost feels like that moment is going to be perhaps a bit of a crude analogy, but it says that I, I, you hear it a lot in stories of like drug addicts when they hit a point where they're just like, I can't do this anymore. Like, it's just yeah. like that kind of ultimate burnout of just, this is ridiculous. Yeah, I hope you're right. You know, I, I, I mean, I hope it doesn't take getting to rock bottom, you know, to, to, to have that, that awakening. But, but um, yeah, you know, just the, you know, the idea that eventually people will start looking at each other and say, why are we arguing? Why are we fighting? <laughs> you know, we all want the same thing in the end you know and so yeah there's no point in, in in you know this yelling match that's going on amongst the the divided camps of vaccine not vaccine you know have and have not us and them all mm. of those illusory boundaries yeah so go, going back to that that meditation thing i'm quite interested in your experience at the uh the solo uh retreat um all right because uh, i mean what how, how was it and and what what led you to, to conclude that you'd had too much in a piece <laughs> it wasn't an actual conscious decision actually uh i i finished the second solitary retreat um and uh i don't know i, I just I, other things started sort of uh, started to take precedent I, um, I entered into a, a couple of online courses studying uh, that were, were quite intensive, that had a lot of homework and a lot of readings and things like that. Um, also, one of my teachers is, is pretty, uh, he, he likes to emphasize that uh, meditation has somehow gotten this privileged uh, place on the, the path, so to speak. In, in many traditions. And, and, you know, if you look at what's known as the Eightfold Path in the Buddhist tradition, meditation is just one of the, the limbs of the Eightfold Path, you know. And so we have seven other uh, aspects of life that, that also need attention and uh, cultivation. I'm going to put a pin in that yeah. because that, that's actually exactly yeah. what I wanted to talk about. So... Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, well, all right. We'll go. We'll go through to it then. So, yeah, we've got, so I see around your your profile picture the the professional image that's on your podcast, uh, the Such Sweet Thunder podcast. For anyone interested, um, it's you've got uh, loving kindness, compassion, joy, equanimity, insight. Uh, I know they're right. not eight, but I'm interested in in those. Uh, what 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 are we? Uh, what are those in reference to? Sure. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Uh, so the loving kindness, uh, compassion, joy, and equanimity are known as in the Buddhist tradition as the Brahma Viharas or the four immeasurable minds. Um, they're also known as the, the divine abodes, uh, which is really kind of a loose translation of Brahma Vihara. Brahma Vihara literally translates to the, the home of the gods. Uh, it's quite so lofty these stuff. are considered yeah yeah actually and I, I really I really um I like that that it is lofty because it, it does encourage the practitioner to really set the bar high recognizing that it th these practices are a lifetime of practice and that's you know there are really specific uh 
meditations around all four of those. Uh, those meditations are, are probably the practices that I've spent the most time doing. I, I've really um, made those really uh, a primary focus of my um, of my practice, of my uh, formal practice. Um, so there's the way it was given to me by my teacher is uh, we're to spend three months on each of the four. So three months on loving kindness, three months on compassion. So it's a year of practice, right? And yeah, that's exactly, that was my, my reaction when, you know, <laughs> my teacher was writing it out on, on, on notebook paper. He's like, so you, you know, you'll do, you know, four weeks on loving kindness for the self and then two weeks on loving kindness for a loved one. And so it ended up being three months and then we went to the next one, three months. And, and so I looked at the paper, I was like, that's a year's worth of practice. <laughs> you know, my teacher kind of scoffed and he's like, well, that'll get you started. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, I was like, wow. And, and you know, kind of, you know, moved out of that session a little bit overwhelmed. But, and that was back in 2004. And wow. I, ever since then, I've been rotating through year after year after year. Uh, at least a big part of my formal meditation is dedicated to that. Uh, and one of the reasons why I, I feel that they're called the immeasurable minds is that you can you can just keep cultivating these qualities. There's there's never you never have too much loving kindness. You never have too much compassion, right? And so, and I've really found that to be true. It's it's kind of like the bottomless well, and uh, they just keep you know bringing more and more fruit in that way. So very important practices. So can we can we go over these? Yeah. Um, just go. I mean, yeah, we could sure. probably make a whole podcast if you if what you say is true. We could probably go over a whole podcast for each one of them, we which probably, doubtless we probably yeah. will in the future. But uh, we'll just <laughs> we'll, we'll breeze past them. Let's get some. Let's get some sort of you know instant yeah. enlightenment. Yeah. Add water. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm most fascinated on uh, equanimity because that's uh, you you did a a course on that very recently, uh, which I was unfortunately not, last week actually yeah was not able to attend yeah. unfortunately, but I'm very interested. So uh, could you go over the idea of equanimity here? Sure, yeah. So equanimity it's it's one of the more for the Brahma Viharas. It's one of the the broadly defined, more broadly defined than loving kindness or compassion or joy, I think. Though joy has a pretty broad definition too. But equanimity is seen in different traditions in different ways. And so in the course that I offered, I tried to cover all all of the bases there. I like to paint with a pretty wide brush when I when I give a retreat like that. So in some of the traditions, equanimity is used synonymous with nirvana itself. It's seen as to it's seen to be uh, at least the doorway to liberation. So how how, how would you so, so how, what, what would be the definition of equanimity here? What would be the right? Because <laughs> I'm not entirely basically I'm not entirely sure what the word means, but it sounds very good. <laughs> I understand. Yeah, it's it is one of those words that you only really ever hear being used by a dharma teacher <laughs> or a meditation teacher, right? So equanimity it kind of means seeing things in balance, having a balanced view of the world, and it's quite important, just particularly you know coming back to where we started with this conversation about you know how there there is a lot of strife and stress and, and suffering in the world, one can tend to really focus on that, mm. right? So when we do that, and we're, we're, we are wired to do that, we have a negativity bias as human beings, you know? So when we are seeing the world in that, you know, out of balanced way, we're not in, we're not being equanimous. You know, we're, we're favoring the darkness over the light. Oh. Whereas when we're in equanimity, we see things more accurately. Yes. And so it involves, yeah, yeah. It involves 
you know, recognizing how uh, our view of the world is uh, influenced by our education, by our upbringing, by the culture we live in. Uh, it, it involves recognizing our preferences and prejudices and not necessarily, we will never, you know, eradicate those. Mm. But the idea is to, to learn to see them for what they are. To, to see because the, oh sorry to, no, no please go ahead to, like I, I, from what I, it sounds like it's like you're trying to understand that the way that that the world isn't one to one with how you perceive it that it's like actually there's exactly there's more there's more beyond your own mindset like you're a you're a piece in a in a bigger picture that's a, that is a part of equanimity. Absolutely, is to see to see the interdependent nature of things that we are all connected to each other, and in fact, you know, our place in the world is just just that, just a, just a, a place in a much larger whole. Also, you know, to to recognize that our our view of the world that's been given to us by our education, our upbringing, our culture is not actually the way the world is presented by nature. Mm, mm. You know, that the world out there, when we can see, we start to see our, our, the verbal overlay that we place over the world, that the word, the word tree and the experience of the tree are two different things. Yeah. Oh, right? that's, that's trippy. When you actually really, when you really think about it, that's quite, <laughs> That's quite weird. So, yeah, when you when you look at uh, when you look at a um, if if you were to suddenly get a kind of amnesia, and you you've sort of forgot all your preconceived ideas, I mean, how would you even, how would you even see a tree? Like you'd mm. you'd, you'd you'd see you know branches, the aura, the rather than go ah tree, it would be a sort of exactly. a more splintered experience, a more Holistic one. Perhaps. <laughs> uh, there, there have been interesting, you know, uh, reports done on people who were born blind, who surgically have their vision corrected, and, and so they, they become sighted. And there, it takes them years, if not their, the rest of their life, to learn to comprehend the world in that way. Because oh, they, they grew up and they were maybe perhaps middle age, you know, 35, 40 or 50. And then they had their vision corrected by surgery. Um, oftentimes people have trouble walking up the stairs because their depth, the, the, the way they perceive depth is would be so different than the way you and I just take it for granted that that's just the of stairs. Man, that's, right? That's fascinating. Isn't it though? Yeah. And so it, it's that kind of view that that equanimity works to, to not so much dismantle, but but allow us to see that our view isn't the way the world is, and to see that see them as two separate experiences rather than the view is the way the world is. You know, because, that's that's an open. Because when you, you have know, that, I, when you have that sort of experience, it kind of it kind of acts as like the crowbar to open up your mind to like all sorts of different i mean I, to me that seems like the way into compassion to realize that you know, to, to empathy to realize that you know oh right so you know this person's acting this way because their experience of the world is completely different to mine and from their perspective i must be seeing things completely differently yeah and and then uh, to, to kind of piggyback on what you just said there the it allows us to recognize that you know, although this person, their view of the world is a product of their upbringing, of their culture, and my view of the world is totally different. At the end of the day, as I was saying earlier, we all want the same thing. Yeah. We all want to be happy. We all want to be free from suffering, you know. And uh, it's just that our, our upbringing, our culture, our education, our society has you know, given us different ways to arrive at that point that are often contradictory. That's 
that sounds to me like i mean i'm gonna go into a bit of esoteric stuff here um because i just love doing yeah. that but uh there's a there's a concept uh in alchemy called uh solve et coagula where uh like solve is where you break a thing down to its absolute sort of smallest mm -hmm. units and then coagula is where you you put it all back together having understood it better and you put it back together in a better formation mm -hmm. and it sounds like equanimity is like the absolute sort of it's the, the the process of like mental solve et coagula. I I really like that. I I'm not familiar with that that term, um, but yes, it's very similar actually. Fantastic. Um, there there are practices in the Tibetan uh, Buddhist tradition that exactly we do exactly that. We visualize the human body, and we you know we so we start with the body, then we go to the arm, then we go to the hand, then we go to the finger, then we go to the fingernail, then we go to the <laughs> cells and. and you know, you, you arrive at emptiness, you know. Yeah. Uh, and the whole body is like that, you know. And then, yes, we, we then bring it, back, bring it all back together but with a much different understanding of the human experience. So, yeah. right. So once we've come to terms with the absolute totality of our entire existence, then we move on <laughs> to... <laughs> um, yeah, insight. That feels like the next logical step. You know, it is very related to uh, equanimity, insight. It's just, the pra the practices are quite a bit different, and so the the actually I'm offering a retreat we're launching next week. Um, probably I'm not sure the listeners will get to this before then. Uh, it launches December first. That's okay. I have other <laughs> things that I can speak about. Uh, but um, so. The practice is a, the practice of insight is a particular type of meditation practice that was given. The ones we'll be focusing on are from the Buddhist tradition. Although, I think you know that when I teach, I teach in a non secular, in a very secular way, in a non denominational way. Mm. Um, but uh, the Buddha gave some really um, profound teachings on how to cultivate a high level of insight. And so, with that insight. Uh, one can see into the nature of their suffering, how, how suffering arises and how we can step away from that suffering. And so that's the focus of uh, the 12 week program that I'm going to be offering. Then we're also encouraged to bring that insight uh, to change and impermanence. Uh, and so there are, there's a whole set of practices around that as well. And that program i'm offering i think will launch around april i don't have the dates quite yet and then there's a third insight program uh, that i'm offering in the fall and these are all 12-week programs so that there's three in the year right and the third one is on non-self which we'll be doing uh, we'll be doing one of those practices we'll be doing was the one i just described to you ah. that's how we take the human body we, we break it down, break it down part by part by part until we recognize that there's no self there like that. So, so <laughs> that's, be, that's quite yeah. a lot to do in 12 weeks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, all of the courses that I offer, you know, all of these teachings are meant to be embraced over the course of a lifetime and practiced over the course of a lifetime. So it's, um, it's not that somebody can come to an eight week program and, and really have mastered compassion or equanimity or loving kindness or joy. And it's not like somebody can go 12 weeks and really have, you know, hopefully one comes out with just a little taste. Mm -hmm. Probably I can say confidently over the past few years of, re of facilitating retreats that all of the participants who, who, who join me do feel some shift you know, there is they 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 come in one way, seeing the world one way, or experiencing compassion in a certain way, and they leave with that. There's a little bit of a shift in that, a little change, a little growth mm. in that, and, and that's really all I can hope for, all I can ask for. I mean, I've right? got to. I mean, I've got to say, you mm. know, I mean, I I did. Well, I I went to two lectures <laughs> on a cruise ship in two years ago, and well, now my hair's grown a bit. So, <laughs> no, genuinely, it, uh, it did, did uh, massively transform my life. So, okay, so the, the principles of, of insight are like the various 
revelations. It's more, would you say it's more of a sort of umbrella term to cover like the various revelations that the the rest of it would entail? Yeah, well, it's the practice of cultivating a really high level of, of attention and energy. Right. And, and then we use that attention uh, to kind of analyze, for lack of a better word, uh, the way certain you know, aspects of life, which we all experience, uh, unfold. You know, all human beings and arguably all living beings have some sort of suffering in their life. It's just mm -hmm. a, a part of, you know, being born, living, aging, and dying. We're all going to experience, you know, some measure of struggle. And so the first stage of that insight practice is, is, is seeing how that happens, seeing how that process unfolds. Because in that seeing, we can start to become free, a little more free from it. Yeah. Ah, right. This is where the two arrows parable from last podcast comes in. Exactly. Ah, exactly. Yeah. It's all fitting together. <laughs> it's all fitting together. <laughs> um, right. Well, uh, so how how would... Yeah, I'm going to just hop back to the top of the list and put uh, loving kindness. What's... Uh, sure. What's, what's, what's that all about? <laughs> <laughs> I, I well, can't phrase it, a question I, I can't phrase no. a spiritual question spiritually I have to like <laughs> use the like the weirdest crude language what's that all about I, I like it I like it I like it it's, it's good so loving kindness is really um it's first we one generally starts with ourself and so the practices there there are around uh, holding oneself in a, in a kind and friendly way. You know, it, ha it has a lot to do with uh, treating ourselves well. Really, you know, kind of part of the, one of the practices that we'll be doing there uh, is, and I'm offering another retreat on loving kindness coming up soon in December. Uh, we um, ask ourselves, how would my best friend speak to me? in this situation or how would my best friend treat me right now mm. you know and, and some some teachers uh, recommend that you write yourself a letter like what what would my best friend advise me to do in this situation and then one sits down so so kind of learning to to be our own best friend is is a practice of loving kindness yeah and so we need to cultivate and generate that energy of goodness for ourselves uh, and then uh, one is invited to share that with the world. So traditionally how that's done is one offers loving kindness to somebody they're fond of, a good friend, uh, a loved one, a family member. Uh, then they offer it to somebody they don't know, a neutral person, a stranger. Uh, and so the uh, term that's often used there is widening the circle of care. Right. So we start with ourselves, widening it out to a loved one, to a neutral person, finally to challenging people, people we don't like very much, people we have difficulty with, yep. and then to the entire world like that. Yeah. So, so it unfolds in stages in that way. Yeah. I, I'm fascinated uh, by that kind of thing because obviously... I think, you know, it's a fairly sort of psychology like 101 that, you know, if you don't have compassion for yourself, how the hell are you going to have compassion for other people? Because, you know, if you, if you if 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 the thing that you're existing in, if the sort of mode in your head you're existing in is like a perpetual, you idiot, you moron, you, you know, that yeah. it's very difficult to be like, OK, but that person over there, they know what's up or, you know, or at least they're yeah, not in a way that doesn't immediately turn it on to so why don't you know it um and i yeah, yeah. and i love the uh i love sure. the expansion of that especially through because this is i think where where again the uh the facing the darkness of the world thing that we're, we're sort of i'm broadly trying to keep this around but uh it's it that's where it really comes in where it's like you've got it you've got a, a certain point uh, as you said, it dropped the the fight of like why are we arguing again? Because it's that 
I mean, I, I, I did, I did a practice like that, um, for, um, the, the country, uh, for my country's prime minister, who has not, in fa the, the government, I have many, many problems with, but, uh, and it's mm -hmm. like the, the prime minister has, you know, done some very questionable things, uh, but I kind of just did think, okay, but like, what was what was his life like and when i was yeah. and when i was expanding that out and i was like ah you know i mean i still don't think what i still don't think what he did is right but yeah that's it's gotta suck when you re when you actually really like think about it it's it, it can't be it can't be fun to be a to be a trump or a you know one of them yeah. one of the great villains of our day because you're you know existing perpetually in a kind in a in a sort of self-loathing yeah i tend to agree with that i i think you know if we're talking about you know extending love and kindness to people we don't like or to you know challenging people uh the the idea then is before we can do that we kind of have to give them a promotion <laughs> you know, you have to, to move them out of that box of being a quote unquote challenging person and at least begin to kind of see the humanity there mm. yeah, yeah because as long as as long as they occupy that that label of a, of being a challenging person or a, whatever we were labeling them as sometimes harsher than that uh they, they remain an object they're just another object in our story, mm. you know. And when when we've when we've put people in that box, it's very difficult to extend kindness to them. It's a very hard. You know? It's a very hard thing to, to to view them in that light because, I mean, the the I, I suppose the the kind of idea, the, the the fear is that you know if I if I give them that kind of compassion then. I'm going to just, you know, be a, I'm just going to be like, hey, man, you know, whatever, man, you know, while they're doing all the horrible stuff and they're just be like, hey, you know what, I can't judge, I, I don't know their life, but you can still disagree with what they do, you can still combat the action, if, but not the, the humanity, if you will. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up because that's, I think, one of the biggest objections to loving kindness and compassion to people we don't like is you know what about social justice right mm. how does that fit in uh, it's a question that i often get when i teach this and so um yes we have to fight for our rights for for equality for all we have to you know work towards uh you know more sense around global warming and climate change we have to we have to you know, bring equality to marginalized people, you know, mm. and that can only happen when we start to, you know, stand up against people who are, you know, creating that kind of suffering in the world. So how does one do that and be kind at the same time? That's really the question, you know, and it is, it is about separating, you know, the behavior from, from the person as you you were speaking to and trying to connect with those people on the human level again really you know i think a lot of it has to do with taking it back to that recognition that we all want the same thing in the end of the day mm. we all want to be happy and so we, and we all want to be free from suffering and so we can see that okay those you know the as you mentioned the trumps or the prime ministers or you know, the people who are you know, in power to to actually work for good and are using that power for not so good, right? So to to recognize that those people are are, are probably very wounded, are are you know probably you know operating you know with not you know operating through a lens where they don't see the world with compassion and kindness. Mm. You know that they they see the world. And Trump has said in many interviews, you know, it's a horrible world. It's a violent world. Yeah. And so having a person in power that sees the world that way, it's, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because they're just going to create the world the way they see it. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's, that, what's that phrase? The world is as you are. 
Exactly. Exactly. And so when we put people in power who see the world that way, the world starts to become that way. And so that's, you know, part of the part of the issue there. Mm -hmm. So coming back to that uh, is is, you know, restoring our view of their of their humanity, because then we've taken the anger out of our response. You know, if we if we really have seen them as as the villain in our story, odds are is when we encounter that that those people we're gonna encounter them through anger or fear. Yeah. Right. We're gonna have that emotional reaction, that charge. So so if we can okay encounter them through the humanity, we have a chance to say okay maybe I don't need to be angry right now. You know, we can kind of pause mm. and put that anger in the back burner and then move with mindfulness, move with compassion and kindness, because that's how they're going to hear it. Right. If, if we move forward and say, ah, oh, you feel foul, foul, feel foul, you jerk, you know, then they're going to yell back at us. And then the war starts again. Yeah. I right. I, I love I, so, I, just aside. I love I love the you feel foul foul you feel foul. <laughs> I'm gonna I want to use that. Yeah, well, you're welcome to use it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, and, and I, I think that's a big part of why the world is so divided right now is because we tend to to you know cling to our views. Going back to that equanimity piece, right? And, and then when we, we meet a person who has opposing views, we tend to put them in that, that we tend to objectify them by their view, mm. right? And then we want to fight them rather than connecting with their humanity. And so the idea then is to, is to you know, if we can take that emotional reactivity away from it. Because then when we, when we can approach somebody as our friend, we have a chance. Yeah. You know, we have a chance of, of, of perhaps being a positive influence. You know, all of the advice that I've ever taken in my life has been given to me by somebody who I thought I could see as a friend. Mm. Right? Yeah. But if, if I see somebody as an enemy, if they try to give me advice, you know, immediately I'm kind of shut down. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. who's, that, who's, I ever, that was, who's ever, like, yeah. looked at their schoolyard bully and thought, you know what? I think he's got a point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. Uh, yet, the, you know, I think many people move through their life with, in just that way. Yeah. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to threaten this person or, or, you know, threaten this group of people or, or, you know, if they're not doing what I want, I'm going to get my lawyers on them or whatever it is, mm. you know, uh, and, and, you know, as I as I always like to say, then the war starts. Yeah, you know, and we know it, we know yeah. what happens when you know. I mean, and again, this is the thing: you might even win the war, but this is the problem because then you just start the cycle yeah. again. Because how many times in history have we heard the story of one group of people was oppressive, the other group in anger overthrew them? Then they became the impressors themselves and another group overthrew them. How many times have we heard that story going round and round and round? Because you kind of, you know, if, you, if you're if you approaching the, the thing out of fear and, and anger, that the fear and anger is not going to suddenly evaporate once you've won. It's not going to suddenly be like, yeah. and now we can all exist in loving kindness. It's it's very much the, the, yeah. the means make the result. The method makes the result. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think you're absolutely right. And we see that happening, as you said, time and time again. So these these practices of, of loving kindness as we start with ourselves and expand out, you know, gradually to, to the entire world, they are really um, a, a ways of radical transformation. Mm. You know, and that's why I, I that's why I like to to, you know, present them as the home of the gods mm, you know because these are are really a, an opportunity for tremendous social change i'm feeling um, i'm feeling the yeah. radical part now i'm feeling that uh <laughs> so yeah and well dropping from love and kindness boom we've got mm. compassion uh where how does yeah. how does 
does loving kindness, how does compassion differ from loving kindness? That's a great question. So they are quite similar. And all actually all of the Brahma Viharas are, are in some ways connected. You know, it's really, it's really one way of looking at it is kind of four uh, chambers of the heart. Ah. You know, or sometimes when I teach, teach the Brahma Viharas, I draw the analogy of the Brahma Viharas make four sides of a prism. But there's five of them. Uh, insight isn't isn't one of the Brahma Viharas. Oh, okay. Right. Insight is, is the, the wisdom, or the the yeah, the wisdom, for lack of a better term, I think, to hold all of the Brahma Viharas in mind. Right. Okay. As That's a so, frame, it's a Chris Luard yeah. special. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. So, so uh, you have four sides of a prism, and that the light of insight shines through. If you're holding the prism up to the side of love and kindness, it creates this beautiful rainbow of light. Ah. And then you shift the prism. It's still the same light of insight, still the same light of wisdom, but shine through the prism. Now you're holding it to the, to the side of compassion. It's a different rainbow light. Right. Okay. Ah, like, yes. I see now. So, so, so that compassion, yeah. Where do we go with this? <laughs> yeah. Well, there, so I'm just kind of drawing on that. They're all related. They're all the same, you know, four sides of the same prism like that. So they do resonate very deeply with each other. And so having a, like, a, as we were saying, having a sense of compassion for people we don't like kind of opens the door for love and kindness, right? We can see how these, you know, people who we might consider enemies also have their fair measure of suffering we can perhaps offer them love and kindness like that so compassion really asks us to kind of open our heart and hold space for people who are in the midst of struggle who are suffering and it starts again with ourself you know so very very often in this world I think when we're we ourselves are struggling, we ourselves are suffering, we tend to like say, "Oh, yeah, pick it up, pick myself up, dust myself off, and you know, just move on to the next thing," without really acknowledging, "Yeah, whew, that was really hard," ah. right? Or you know, really giving ourselves space to feel that the 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 to feel the broken leg, or or to to feel the broken heart, or to feel you know, the aspect of losing somebody, you know, these very, very natural, you know, the Buddha said birth, sickness, aging, and death, not getting what one wants, getting what one doesn't want. All of these are sufferings. Right. And that, and all of these things we all experience. But if we don't have self-compassion around that, you know, we kind of harden to our experience of life, you know? Yeah, yeah. If, Compassion asks us first. It asks of ourselves to to have that soft heart towards ourselves, to recognize that that our life will have its fair measure of struggle and its fair measure of joy. Yeah, I mean, I suppose actually, because that's that's I, I love that that thing about the soft heart. Because again, there is a, a, a an, an objection, which is you know you gotta you gotta toughen yourself up against the the the, the roughness of the world you know otherwise everything will just because it, it's it's a, it's it's it hurts to live in that in that space i mean it's not this the thing this is this ain't you know sunshine and rainbows time all round uh it's yeah. you know you, you can really you've got to have the you know to have the high highs you've got to have the the low lows and you've got to really yeah. you've got to be there because if, if you just if you just, as you said, brush it off, move on to the next thing, you just, that, that, that charge, that charge doesn't go away. You're just pushing it down until eventually, exactly. you know, something happens, which sends a whole, the whole lot up. Yeah, that, that very often happens. You know, we, we kind of repress our anger, our fear, our hurt, and then something, usually something quite minor happens, mm. but it just resonates in the right way at the right time with all of that un unprocessed material. And boom, you have a volcano, right? Absolutely. Very often it happens 
that way. Also, you know, part of the problem with, you know, pushing things aside or, or you know, pretending like we're not hurting in some way, uh, we, we kind of move into this way of being in the world that's quite numb. And so if we've numbed out the pain, we've also numbed out the pleasure. Right. Right. And so we kind of then start to inhabit this kind of flat land of indifference, which is really not, um, you know, not a really uh, a pleasant way of living life. You know? Mm. What, you know, life becomes really black and white and we miss the, the spectrum of color. Do you know what? You know? This, this is quite suddenly I've had that I was talking to a, a friend of mine on, on this podcast the other day and uh, he was saying how he was watching a news report about a, um, a drone strike uh, which had killed tons of civilians, false information. Mm. And they were talking about this sort of horrible tragedy. And then he went and now on to the weather. And, yeah. uh, you know, that that kind of it's I, I feel more and more. There is a kind of media induced, um, as you say, numbness, uh, a media mm -hmm. induced, but uh, not even like a, a media induced helplessness of like, mm -hmm. and here's a thing that you can do nothing about. And here's another thing you can do nothing about. And here's another mm -hmm. thing and another thing. And so mm -hmm. you, you get to the point that even when you are at the point where you can actually affect real change, you don't. Right, right. And, uh, you know, I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, bringing it back to the compassion practices, those practices are designed to allow us to remain open to all of that. Mm -hmm. And, when, you know, sometimes when I say that to people, they're like, well, yeah, I'm not going to do that retreat. You know, I'll do the next <laughs> one. <laughs> but but, but the, the good thing is, is that as we do start to open, again, we start to thaw out and more joy becomes available. Mm. And joy in these practices is, is considered to be the balance of compassion. And so when, when I offer compassion practices, I often offer joy side by side yeah. so that we can be in balance. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so people start to actually see that when you can start to open the heart to the suffering of yourself and to the suffering of others, there's enough space in the heart to hold all of that. Mm. That, it, that it actually is one of my favorite teachers likes to say uh, ken wilbur he often says it hurts more but it bothers you less oh, that's i really I, yeah i really that's... find that to be quite uh quite descriptive of the compassionate process mm. no. oh because you know that and... that really sorry that 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 one's really lit a, lit a match in me because uh, okay. I I love that that feeling because because it, it's it's true. Uh, since I've been like doing the this stuff, I mean I've had a fair amount of pretty rough uh, experiences. A lot of a lot mm. of internal stuff. I mean, I mean in this I've been in this room for the majority of these two years, uh, and a lot of a lot of deep stuff ends up coming out um, of sort of you know panic attacks and uh mm. you know depressions fears uh anger and you know not just at myself but at the like at, at, at you know outside things um you know and, and and all this stuff but at the same time i feel more like i can handle it like it's mm -hmm. you know it, it's all right and and even sometimes <laughs> I mean, this I don't know whether this is psychotic or not, but as I was experiencing, like, one of the depths of, a like, a real bad, like, panic attack, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, do you know, this is actually quite, in a way, quite pleasant. Like, in a way, quite an enjoyable sort of thing, because, mm -hmm. hey, this is, like, this is life. This is as much life as anything else, and it's better than yeah. experiencing nothing at all. Well, there you go. Yeah, and that in a way is, you know, appreciating the the ability to experience. Yeah. Right. Rather than you know, we we come back to the to that having gratitude for the context of life itself, rather than cursing the content. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Oh, that's another yeah. good one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, that, you know, I, I guess moving on to the joy practices, because joy 
that the one of the primary um, teachings of the joy practices is to just to do that, to take joy and to celebrate uh, the actual experience of life itself. Yeah, to have the appreciation for for our connection with this beautiful planet. Uh, that uh, one of my favorite practices that that we do in the joy retreat is we meditate on breathing in. And as we breathe in the plants and the trees and the flowers breathe out. And as we breathe out the plants and the trees and the flowers breathe in. And we just, we visualize that and we meditate on that for quite some time. And it creates this real, just a circulation between our, ourself and mother earth. Uh, and it's, it's a real uh, joy of practice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I, I love this. I, I love the, um, as I say, the thing I, I really, I really like about these practices is they enable you to truly experience the totality of life. Because I think if you, if you're existing on that kind of low level thing, like only, only stuff like really good feel, food and you know a really good book or a really good feel, like only the like really good stuff. Whereas you know mm. if you're, you exist, you can experience like the whole spectrum of existence to varying degrees because obviously we still have preferences but everything is yeah. everything is perfect in a way you know and it's quite i mean that's it's a bit of a controversial thing to say if you you go up to a you go up in a party and say everything is perfect <laughs> you get some odd looks but <laughs> depends on the kind of party you're at but yeah <laughs> <laughs> But yes, uh, and, and it, it, you're right. I mean, on some level, and you know, that's a very profound statement on 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 some levels. You know, that everything is perfect in its own way. The Zen master, you know, once said, uh, "Snowflakes fall, each one finding its perfect place." And and so it's it is that 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 there is a reason for for everything's unfolding. Um, and these practices are really designed to allow us to to inhabit that kind of experience where yes there is you know there is suffering and there is joy there is kindness and there is space for compassion uh and that again i think you know touching back on that equanimity that equanimity allows us to see that that things do unfold in their right time in their right way you know, also, you know, in on a cellular level, the human body looks very, very violent. Mm -hmm. You know, the immune system is attacking the virus, is attacking, you know, and the, the digestive tract is, you know, crushing the food. And, and, you know, and all of this, you know, turbulence is happening. But when we when we come up to, to a conscious level, everything looks peaceful. It's probably some... Uh... Yeah. Yeah, probably some Donald Trump bacteria in in your gut as it's like <laughs> as it's consuming another bit of like d half digested burger, just be like the world is a nasty place. It's all <laughs> violence and horror. And hopefully the immune system can take care of that, you know. Yeah. And you know before it becomes cancerous. And 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 you know you look at the ocean. You know you look at the surface of the ocean. Everything looks really you know on some days very peaceful and calm uh, and some days it could be turbulent but it's still you know the ocean beautiful yeah. right but then we look you know down beneath that there's sharks that are eating fish and there are fish that are eating shrimp and there's shrimp that are eating bacteria and so there is this you know you know balance of of violence and peace that's happening all of the time and in all ecosystems you know, and at the same time, it's all unfolding in its perfect rhythm and its perfect place. Feels like the opening of yeah. um, Blue Velvet. I don't know whether you've you've seen that film. It's um, I haven't actually. Oh, it, yeah, I'm a big I'm a big David Lynch fan. Okay, so it starts out with um, it's like you see that Blue Velvet starts playing, and you see this whole you know white picket fence suburban America. There's like lovely mm. green lawns, red fire trucks going in. It's all very peaceful, and then it take, like starts zooming in on the grass getting closer and closer and closer and so eventually you start seeing like the 
termites and the beetles uh, under the surface mm. and they're gnawing and they're gnashing and tumbling over each other and it's like yeah. sort of a dark chaotic like sort of thing and the music fades out and all we've got is like this sort of wailing and gnashing of teeth and it's quite it's quite effective yeah. and again yeah. you know on the and, and i loved what you said about the ocean because you know whether it's it's rough or it's smooth still the ocean you've you've never seen a you've never seen a storm that's made you go bloody hell that ocean's acting a bit off isn't it <laughs> shouldn't be doing exactly. that at all <laughs> right yeah, right <laughs> yeah exactly exactly and so you know william shakespeare i forgot what play it was in king lear or hamlet i don't remember but uh there's a character that says there's nothing right or wrong but thinking makes it so and it is just the that tendency of preference and prejudice labeling things now again you know we can get into trouble with this because <laughs> there is a, a great amount of injustice in the world yeah that that needs to be acknowledged and addressed and, and hopefully eventually there'll be some healing around all of that mm. um and and at the same time we do live in this type of ecosystem where life is unfolding mm. it feels to me yeah. i suppose on the broader scale of of things it's just me i want to stress this is just my conjecture uh this does not represent the views of chris or indeed anyone uh else except me but it feels like all the the suffering that humanity has, has been going through I feel there's a kind of, you know, there's, it, it feels like there's a sort of, there, there was a, a version at the beginning when we were all apes and we were all sort of, you know, I mean, we were still going through sickness and illness and that, but we were, you know, sort mm -hmm. of okay with it because it was just, you know, just ape life. It's just how it be. Mm -hmm. And then as we've been growing more and more awareness, all this kind of suffering and that has been going. And again, solve et coagula, breaking it down into the most mm -hmm. sort of, basic components so that it can be reassembled into something better and that if it's because mm. otherwise if you don't this i suppose this thing you know if the buddha didn't experience all that suffering and all that uh that pain and and you know nearly starving himself as an aesthetic and then living mm. a, a, a sort of numb existence in the in the the palace if he hadn't gone through all that how would he have been the buddha Oh, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's a, uh, in the Buddhist tradition, there is a, the analogy of the lotus flower, which has to go through, you know, this dirty, nasty water uh, and mud and, and, and everything. And then when it emerges from the water, it emerges as this beautiful lotus. And, and that, yeah, that's the teaching of the lotus flower. They, uh, many teachers point at the flower and say, you know, we are like the lotus. So very, very similar. Yeah. They're, you know, an event. The idea is eventually that all, all people are all. In fact, everything in life will eventually blossom in that way. Uh, um, it's just that's very optimistic, and, but I, <laughs> and I tend to think it will happen eventually. Um, but uh, and yes, you're right. I think there is this, you know, arc of evolution from cave people, you know, where we were you know, in, in kind of the ignorance of Eden, so to speak. Mm. And then we, you know, ate from the tree of knowledge. We said, okay, you know, the tree of knowledge allowed us to discern right and wrong, you know, yes. for better or for worse. So then we, we kind of evolved out of that. And, and now, you know, we have buildings and, you know, capitalism and all of this. <laughs> and eventually I think the idea is we will transcend this you know stage of development and we'll move into another stage of development where perhaps we are more compassionate and kind and loving towards others and ourselves yeah um, but i think it is just a stage of development that we are moving through at this point yeah fantastic wow well that's <laughs> an hour uh i don't know whether you want to end that there because that feels perfect um, Does feel like a good ending, yeah. Should we? Yeah. I think yeah. to to round us to round us off. Um, let's do a. I think can we can we do a a loving kindness compassion meditation? Sure. I wasn't ready for that, but I'll get my bell. All right. <laughs> I've got my own bell if you prefer, but. 
Uh, a bell here. Oh, Either way. Two bells. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And so the invitation here is now to come into this present moment experience, allowing the body, mind, and heart to rest. We'll begin offering these very precious phrases of loving kindness to our own heart as if we were bringing our heart the most precious, rare gift. And with each phrase, we'll briefly visualize or imagine what our life would look and feel like if each phrase was completely reflective of our own life circumstance. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I live a life of peace without struggle. May I open to things just as they are. May I experience the world opening to me just as I am. And now while breathing in and breathing out, allowing a visualization to arise in the mind's eye, visualizing the entire world and all of the inhabitants of the world. And people from all walks of life, all race and ethnicities, all religions, values, belief structures, people from all economic backgrounds, sexual preferences and orientations. The great, the medium, the mighty, the short or the small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away those born and to be born. And recognizing how all of these beings are moving towards comfort and away from discomfort, just like we are. Our very root cause is exactly the same. And moving forward from this place, we'll offer these very precious gifts of loving kindness to the world, including ourself. Visualizing and imagining what life would look and feel like if each phrase was completely reflective of the world's circumstance. May we all be happy. May we all be healthy. May we 
all live a life of peace without struggle. May we all open to things just as they are. May we all experience the world opening to us just as we are. And now, while breathing in and breathing out, allowing any visualization in the mind's eye to dissolve. You can allow those to fade back into the open, spacious awareness from which they came. And in a few breaths, we'll begin to shift out of the meditation. But in doing this, Notice any sensations of love and kindness, any feelings. This might be a warmth or it could be a very slight tingling or a feeling of openness, softness. Any feeling of goodness. And bring your attention deeply into that feeling. And allow it to really soak into your heart, down to the marrow of the bones. And re really amplify this experience of loving kindness, turning up the volume as if you were turning up the volume on your favorite song on the stereo. And so we'll just sit with that for a few breaths. Just allowing this loving kindness to marinate through our heart, our body, our mind. And as we begin to close this meditation, I'll cue the shift back by ringing the bell three times. And if you wish, you can allow the sound wave of the bell to ripple through your awareness. This can sometimes serve as an amplifier for loving kindness as well. That was Chris Lillard, everyone. If you enjoyed that loving kindness meditation, then please check out the full and uncut version on his podcast, Such Sweet Thunder, as well as finding him on the suchsweetthunder.org, not .com, .org website. Chris offers one-to-one -one tuition on meditation, as well as numerous lectures and courses on several topics of Buddhism. I hope you enjoyed. Check him out. I'll see you next time. Bye.